All right, Brother Dobbins is going to get wired up, and let me just give his introduction while he's doing that. Uh, most of you know Brother Dobbins by now. He's been down for us several times and preached. He's one of the missionaries that we support. He lives in Zambia, uh, Chingola currently, but looking to go up to Kasama as the Lord wills. And uh, this brother, this is the first missionary that I ever met after I got saved. First missionary I ever met. Went off to Bible school. He became the first missionary I ever supported. So I have financially supported this brother longer than any other missionary that, uh, that is involved in our lives. And I say this, be, well, he is my best friend, so I don't mind giving him a compliment. But I say this because it's the truth, not just because he's my friend. Uh, I've known a lot of missionaries in the past 20 some odd years, but I don't know of any this good. As in, in, my, in my estimation, maybe the best living missionary we have is Brother Mike Dobbins. I have learned a tremendous amount from this brother, and his friendship means the world to me. And uh, he's always a blessing to us. I'm looking forward to what he has for us both now and later on tonight. So you folks, open your hearts. Let the Spirit of God talk to you through this vessel. So brother, you come this way. When the Holy Ghost is... All right, that was a discussion about how long we're keeping you today. <laughs> now, there's two things you're never supposed to believe, right? That's the bad things people say about you and the good things people say about you. <laughs> as long as you ignore, ignore those two things, you'll be fine. Because if you start believing things like that, it will mess you up. First Samuel chapter... Best living missionary. First, I forgive you for that. First Samuel chapter 7, verse 9... You know, the problems with comments like that is you know yourself. You know? A man that believes things like that about himself doesn't know himself very well. Right? You ever watch that TV show where the guy does something horrible and commits a horrible crime? And when you're younger, you say, how could he do that? And as you get older, you go, hmm, I could do that. <laughs> Isn't it? Because you've observed your human heart longer and you know down in there, there's something wrong. That's why you needed to be saved. That's why you need a new man in there. That has nothing to do with anything we're going to talk about. 1 Samuel chapter 7. We sang that song, Come Thou Fount, because we're going to preach on that passage where it comes from. Here I raise mine Ebenezer. Uh, I read a book years ago. I'll, ju I'll just say it. Amen. Called The Purpose Driven Church. And the guy said, we've got people singing this song, raising their Ebenezer. They don't even know what an Ebenezer is. Well, you know the answer to that. You go get educated. When I don't know something, you know what I do? I go learn. I don't throw the song out and the whole song book out. But that's what that book told you to do. So now we're years past that, amen? Hopefully, we're all over that. I mean, we've gotten over it, not we're all over it. 1 Samuel chapter 7. If, if you like that book, I forgive you. If you'll forgive me. Amen? Nobody's laughing. We can love each other. I'm not upset about it. First. <laughs> First Samuel. I didn't like that book. First, it says throw out the King James Bible, by the way. First, I'm not for that. First, Cham, First Samuel, chapter seven. What did I say? First Samuel. First Chan. This will help some of you. Channel 103. Turn to channel 103. First Samuel, chapter seven, verse nine. Lord, help me. Verse nine. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard him. Amen. I like that. Verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines did not care. The Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a thunder, with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. I'm not sure what that means in English. We'll talk about it. And they were smitten before Israel. Verse 11. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah. And pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto, or up unto here, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. That's what I want. I want the Lord to help me. Today we're going to talk about the Lord has helped us. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ without him. There'd just be no hope, no hope in life, no hope in death, but I, I'm thankful for uh, those of us that are saved. We can say today, whether we live 
or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Whether we live therefore or die, Lord, we belong to You. Thank You for Jesus Christ. And Lord, if someone is in our midst today and they don't know Your Son is their Savior, I pray today the Spirit of God would touch their heart and they would see eternity and heaven and hell and the need for salvation, the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. And Lord, for those of us that are saved, thank You, Lord, we can raise our Ebenezer today and say, You've helped us up to here. You've been so good to us up to here. And Lord, we pray You'd help us going forward. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm preaching on this today on the seventh anniversary of the church because this is a marker in Israel. This is a marker in the history of Israel and in the ministry of a man named Samuel. You know, these Philistines, I don't like them. I don't. These Philistines, if you go back all the way to Genesis 26, these are the same Philistines. They're putting dirt in the wells of Abraham. Why? Just because they're rotten. I mean, here's a man, Abraham. He's the the father of the nation of Israel. And these are the enemies of Israel all the way back 1,800 years before Christ. They're putting uh, dirt in the wells of Abraham. I don't like them. They're, They're too rotten to explain all the terrible things they've done to fight Israel and the Lord's people. We all know Goliath, right? Goliath is a big problem, you know. He, he was a big giant. And you know, David made him look silly. He did. Matter of fact, David took a stone and a sling. And one day, Goliath had the first intelligent thought ever enter his mind. It was a solid thought. Right here. You didn't get that at first, some of you. That was the first time a solid thought ever entered that giant's mind. He defied the armies of the living God. That's just not intelligent. You know, there's, there's a lady I'm working with to try to get saved. I may have said this last time. She's my bo- she was my boss when I worked at the bank in the USA. And she told me yesterday, she said, I just cannot believe heinous crimes committed by people Those people can go to heaven, and I'm just a doubter, and I go to hell. (laughs) What does that have to do with anything? There's a perfect man dies on the cross. You know, you you don't go to traffic court and say, what about the people out there that robbed banks? You admit your guilt, and you pay. And if you worry about other people, the judge says, contempt, lock him up. Isn't it? You go to court, you worry about yourself. You don't look around like Simon Peter and say, Lord, what do you have for this man? (laughs) Lord said, you don't worry about this man. You worry about Simon Peter. Amen. Now that's just extra, okay? Come back to verse 9. In verse 9, Samuel offers a sacrifice and he prays to the Lord. The Lord heard him. In verse 10, the Philistines come to fight. The Lord thunders from heaven. The word discomfit. (laughs) I don't use it. I don't use all these English words, Amen. Discomfit means to rout, to defeat, to scatter in fight, to cause to flee, to disperse, to overthrow. Amen. It says the Lord thundered from heaven. Israel just, they don't have to do a lot, do they? Now the Hebrews in verse 11, they're no longer afraid. It said in verse 7, the Hebrews were afraid. They're not afraid now. Now the Hebrews are running after the Philistines, smiting them. Verse 12, Samuel takes a marker, takes a stone, And he calls it Ebenezer. The Lord has helped us against two, against this enemy. This enemy enemy is a pain. Now I'm going to say number one. In verse 10, it says the enemy has drawn near. It says there, as Samuel was offering the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle. Now I'm going to say, maybe you've noticed, life is a fight. If you've not, you've just not lived very long. I remember it. I remember being young and hearing preaching and thinking, what are they talking about? Life is great. I live home with mom and dad. I did buy my own car, but they put gas in it. Hey, they put petrol in it. I go to school. I hang out with my friends. The girls are all beautiful. I found this one. You know, life. And and I looked at life and I would hear the preaching and I would think, what are they talking about? My life is grand. Life is not a fight. Then you start living a few years. Isn't it? And you think, man, life is, whoa. One, one, one of my children walked up to me one time and said, Hey, Dad, I just want you to know, I've stopped reading the Bible. I've stopped praying for several weeks now. And, you know, I, I didn't do, you know, the first thing in you goes, What? You know, but I didn't do that. You know, my, 
I only do that about 5 to 10% of the time in my parenting. Normally, I act really relaxed and presidential. <laughs> well, I'm the president at home, so I act like a president. And I just said, oh, yeah? Why'd you do that? And my son said, I just got tired of the fight, man. It's a fight to do it. and I, I get tired of it. And he continued and said, but you know, I started again because I decided it's a fight that's worthwhile. And so I just sat there. I never did have to freak out. I just sat there and said, that's good, son. That's really good. But life is a fight. The enemy is drawn near to this great saint of God named Samuel. He's making a sacrifice. And his commitment to God was real. It was on display. And the Lord was being honored and the enemy had no respect. The enemy doesn't care about your commitment. The enemy doesn't care about your zeal. The enemy doesn't care that God's being honored. The enemy moves in and says, I'm going to destroy you. I don't care how great you are. I don't care if you're the great man, Samuel. It doesn't matter. If you're saved and you're trying to serve the Lord, then life is going to be a constant fight. It's a fight just to... I'll I'll address my church in Zambia and I say, I know you don't read the Bible. I know you don't. Here's how I know. It's hard for me to do it. It's hard to read that Bible every day, isn't it? It's hard. I get up and I say, man, this is hard. I'm going to push through this. Eh? I don't know how many times, I'm not going to tell you how many times I've been through the Bible, but it is year after year. I may have said it before. When I read the Bible, I know what's on the next page before I get there. So it's so easy for your brain to go, I've got to go do that, I've got to go do that. And then you get done reading and you go, hmm, that was good. I didn't pay attention to it and read it. But I read it. And I'll be honest with you, when I eat food, I don't really pay a whole lot of attention to how it digests either. I don't. I just eat it, and I go on with life. And I've learned sometimes that works with the Bible, too. You say, well, you, are you advocating reading the Bible and not pay attention? Not at all. I'm, reading, I'm advocating pressing on. You've got to just keep pressing on. Even when you think, well, I didn't get anything out of that. It's a fight. And you better not say, oh, I'm not getting anything out of it. I'm not going to do it today. Okay, do that, every, do that with your meals, too. Well, I just don't get anything out of eating this. I'm not going to eat. See how it works. <laughs> It doesn't work spiritually. It doesn't work physically. But if, if you're not saved, I'll tell you this. The devil likes for you to just coast and have an easy life. He's not going to bring a lot. It's the total opposite of what you see the TV preacher saying. The TV preacher says, you know, the Lord wants you to be comfortable. The Lord wants you to have it easy. It's the opposite. The devil wants you, everything to go smoothly in your life. Because as soon as there's a tragedy, one of the first thoughts of man is, Ooh, I need the Lord to help. You know, every, every atheist that falls out of a 10-story building says, Oh my God! <laughs> there are no atheists that fall out of 10-story buildings. <laughs> Amen. You know, many Christians, they quit living for the Lord just because it's easier. It's easier not to go to church. It's easier not to witness. You know, the, the, when I was growing up, the joke was, you know, the man and the woman, they're in the car going to church and they're fighting, they're arguing, and they come around the corner and they go, hello, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. And you know, just as soon as they got out of the car, that's when they quit. Sure, they quit fighting. Man. You know why that happens on Sunday morning? Because life's a fight. The devil doesn't want you going. The, the, the easiest and best time to have a fight's on the way, of church, way to church. Can I get a witness? Amen. <laughs> Everybody's scared. No, you know, everybody's a hypocrite. You know, oh, I don't want to act like I've ever fought with the wife on the way to church. It's just easier not to go. You know, I, when I meet a person, I don't just meet them. You know, I start making a strategy of how to witness to them. And it's a pain. It's pressure. There's this constant pressure of, I've got to care about people and worry about people, whether they go to heaven or hell. Now, I've met this guy, and I can't just say, hey, nice suit. You know, in my mind, I'm formulating how am I going to get to know him and influence him and witness to him and lead him to Christ. And furthermore, we live in the last days, so the pressure is at a fever pitch. It says in 2 Timothy 3.1, we live in perilous times. In the last days, perilous times shall come. The enemy has come in very closely now with great boldness and unconcern for your commitment. He knows he has a certain time. In Luke twenty two fifty three, 53, Jesus said, When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands, hand against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. And as we approach the coming of the Lord, 
The devil is ratcheting things up and the pressure is getting greater and greater. And It's like being in a pressure cooker, isn't it? That pressure just builds and builds and it gets hotter and hotter. And some days you just go, Aah! Now I know you don't because you're not like me. I have this, you know, thing. This pers- personality, you know. I have this personality. I control it a lot. You think I'm not controlling it, but I do. It's a lot worse than it appears. Revelation 12.12 12 says, The devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Life is a fight. There are enemies without. There's the world. I remember I was a youth director back in 91, 92, 93. This is 1990s. Not 1890s. And, uh, and uh, I was speaking to my youth group. And I said, young people, you need to know the whole world is against you. And one, one real, you know, she's a good lady now. She raised her hand and said, Brother Mike, I just cannot believe. I'm at the grocery store till. And the lady at the grocery store till scanning my items is against me. And I thought, oh, brother. The whole world's against you. It's a system, isn't it? The whole, the whole world is against what you believe. And to live a holy life, the world is against it. And everything, some of you have lived long enough to know, like I witnessed to a young man yesterday, I said, now, the devil's going to tell you you're not saved. When you commit a sin, the devil's going to... And, and immediately, he said one word, he said, yeah, temptation. It's pressure. It's the world. Then John 10.10 10 says, the thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. You know, those are serious means of attack. Those are not, you know, I, I'm going to commit identity fraud, <laughs> is it? I mean, that, steal, kill, and destroy? That's an enemy. The Christian has the whole world against him. Everywhere you turn, you need the Lord. You need the saints of God to encourage you. You need to hear preaching. You, you will not manage on your own. You won't. You may say, well, you know, I just believe I'll sit here at home, I'll read the Bible, I'll, you know, I'll go out and worship God in my own way, I'm not going to congregate with people. You, you will not run the race to the end where Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've, you will not do that on your own. You find the Apostle Paul, he was surrounded with people. You say, well, one time he said, only Luke was with me. And it was a grief. Because he said in one place, greet this guy and this guy and the women who labored in the, with, in the Lord for, with me. He had people that helped support him. You need the church. The enemies are serious. Then you have that enemy within. You look in the mirror and you go, public enemy number one. You say, no, I love that guy in the mirror. I know. He's, he's your biggest problem. My wife and I say it all the time. We say, you know, that guy's his own worst enemy. You, know, you try to help the guy, you know, and, and the guy just, <laughs> everything you can possibly do to help him, he's just, <laughs> bang, back into the problem. You know, like swimming pool. <laughs> into the problem. You're trying to help him, trying to help him, trying to help him, you know, and, and you, this is the problem you've got to stay away from. And he, and he says, okay. <laughs> you're like, what can you do? You are your own worst enemy. You say, I don't believe it, I'm lovely. What? You know, I mean, we think you're lovely. But God knows you're your own worst enemy. That's why he said, crucify the flesh. You know, many of you are saying, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give the flesh a millimeter. You're not going to last long. You're not going to make it to the end of the battle. You're not because the flesh is going to say, now one more, now one more, now five more, now ten more, now fifteen more, now twenty more. And before long you say, yeah, how did I get here from there? The flesh just wants you to a little bit at a time. You say, who is that? That's you. You say, no, I'm a good person. No, there's a good person in you if you're saved. That's not you. That is not you. You'd better start telling your flesh, no. And when he starts negotiating, you take the knife and you say, cool, take that. You don't, you don't negotiate. You crucify the flesh. You kill the enemy. What did they do here to the enemy? Did they say, let's sit down, peace treaty. Let's talk and negotiate with these heathen. No. Maybe you've noticed life is a battle. Maybe you've noticed the Lord has no problem with the enemy. Verse 10. Quickly and decisively. This is 1 Samuel 7.10. Quickly and decisively. It says, the Philistines drew near in the middle of the verse. Then suddenly, boom. The Lord thundered with a great thunder from heaven. They were smitten. Quickly and decisively, the Lord sorts out the enemy. If you can hand the battle over to the Lord, you'll be all right. An enemy that's been a constant nuisance, 1,800 years, whack! Not a new enemy, the same old enemy. Don't you get tired? I get tired of this. Now, Lord, I've committed this sin again. 
I get so tired of it. I just, sometimes I just want to go, do I have to say it? I mean, you know. And it says, if we confess our sins, and I say, okay, I'm so tired of it. You say, is life a fight? Life's a fight. You say, well, I just quit confessing. You're in trouble. You don't get tired of it and quit. You, you don't say, well, I'll just go my way. The Lord knows. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't get tired and say, I'm not going to confess my sins anymore. The Lord knows what they are. He's having grace on me. You're going to end up the wrong way. You are. The Lord thundered from heaven. Problem solved. It says, that old serpent, the devil, that's been causing problems 6,000 years, quickly and decisively, come to Revelation 20. Hold your place in 1 Samuel 7. I may be back there today or tomorrow. Or... <laughs> Revelation 20. Quickly, decisively, after 6,000 years of trouble. Revelation 20, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints, and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Just like that. They all gathered around Jerusalem and boom, just like this. The Lord thundered from heaven, fire came down from heaven. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, today the tribulations of life might feel like, uh, you know that thing they roll the tarmac with? Remember when they used to pave the roads? Remember that? I remember when I, when I was a kid. They would put the tarmac out and then they put this big roller out. And they would roll it. Remember that? Some of you aren't old enough to remember. In your lifetime, they've never done that. But um, <laughs> Is that how you feel about life? Life's just, what? Oh, it's just rolling over you and it's, it's horrible and it's a problem and the enemies are against you. I, there's good news. The Lord's with you. Samuel there. He said, man, the Lord's helped us. The Lord's been with us. You know, we go from time to time in life and say, man, this, this is a problem I'm going into. This is the fire. You need to remember, there, was, there were three Hebrew children. They went into the fire, didn't they? And it says in Daniel 3.25, Nebuchadnezzar looked in the fire and he said, how many men did we throw in the fire? He, his memory was like mine. They just threw them in. And he said, I've forgotten already. How many men did we throw in? And they said, three. He said, I see a fourth man. And his form is like the Son of God. I love it. I told, I told a youngster yesterday, I said, that Ethiopian unit, he's there with Philip, eh? And he says to Philip, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And the Ethiopian said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar said, I see the form of a man in there. He's already in the fire. His form is like the Son of God. So I'll tell you, if you're in the fire today or, you're, or you say there's a test out and this test is going to come back and we're going to go into the fire, there's good news. When you go into that fire, the Lord's going to reach out His hand and say, hey, it's not that hot in here, is it? It looked so hot on the outside, didn't it? It's kind of like potch. <laughs> no, it's a lot hotter, isn't it? You look from the outside of that fire and you saw the other pers person go in. Am I saying fire? Sorry, fire. Sorry. It's the way I grew up. You look at that fire and you say, wow, that person went in there. I can't go in there. That's too hard for me. But then you get into the fire and the Lord said, puts His arm around you and He says, see, it's not that bad. I'm in here. It's not that bad. You come in here and you get close to me. I don't want it. You say, what? To get close to the Lord? Whew. Some of the process, you know, the process Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That fellowship there, my flesh says, I don't know if I want that fellowship, but it's coming. You say what? Suffering. You say to who? Every sinner. If you're not a sinner, it's not coming your way. But if you're a sinner, suffering's coming. And when you go into that heat, you go in and you say, well, Lord, it's not that bad in here. I feel like the fan's on. It feels great. I feel, I feel pretty good. Why? Because the presence of the Lord moves in and says, I'm here to help. Hitherto the Lord hath helped us. He's a helper. He's a comforter. He intercedes. I laugh at these churches in Zambia. You know, they, they put up Sunday school or Sunday morning, Wednesday, intercessory prayer time. Like, That's all? <laughs> no supplications? No giving of thanks for all men, just intercessions. They don't even know what that means or what it's talking about. Do they? The Lord's a helper. He's an intercessor. 
You know, I remember my dad, I, I'd, I'd be nine or ten or eight or whatever, and I'd be crying, and my dad would put his hand on me and say, Mike, it's going to be okay. And I'll be honest with you, I, I would look at him very skeptically and think in my heart, the world is ending. It's not going to be okay. You know, my own dad, I didn't believe him. <laughs> my own dad, I'd look at him and think, you don't know, man, you can't fix it. This is horrible. The boy at school beat me up, or really, I beat him up and got spanked. <laughs> But it's horrible. <laughs> but you know, it's so different when the great comforter of God, the Holy Spirit, speaks the word and says, Son, it'll be okay. E- even if it gets as bad as it's going to get, in my Father's house are many mansions. You're going to get rich. When it gets really, really bad, you're going to get really, really rich. Because you're going to move into a mansion with gold. Now you have to die. <laughs> right? But I mean, that's as bad as it gets if you're saved. It doesn't get worse than that. Immediately after it gets as bad as it gets, whoosh, mansion, gold streets, in the presence of God, and the Son of God. You say, well, I have to go into the fire. I, I know. I know it's hard. It's hard to have pain and suffering. I don't like it. I, I cringe from it. But I know the Lord's a helper in it. Hitherto the Lord has helped us. Look at verse 12. I'm in 1 Samuel. Verse 12. We find a marker was placed as remembrance for what? Victory. There's a victory here. Now, Samuel didn't bring about the victory, and the children of Israel didn't bring about the victory. The Lord brought it about. And today we're going to place a marker in the history of this church, and the marker is not a stone we're going to bring in here and worship like an idol and paint and and look back to it and remember and go, Oh, look at that stone. Oh, that makes my heart feel good. We're not going to do that. Amen? Amen. We're not going to bring anything like that. The marker is the precious cross of Calvary. We're going to place that marker and look to that cross as the Hebrews look to that serpent on the pole. And we're going to say like Samuel, Hitherto the Lord has helped us. We don't have to pay for sin. We don't have to go to hell. We don't even have to work to be saved. We don't have to do anything complicated. You know, one, one guy tells me, you have to find the church that uh, Christ founded. The very first church. If you find that church, you can be saved. You don't have to do it. The cross says, no, you don't. You just come to the cross. There's a marker there. We come personally and we say, Lord, I'm going to hell. Help me. I need a Savior. I need the cross applied for my sin payment. It's so simple. You say, how simple? It's so simple they overlook it. And they say, what about the heinous crimes of these horrible sinners? What about them? And they look at the cross and they go, that can't be it. That's, they, what, it's my righteousness. Look, I'm better than them. That's not the marker. Today's a marker in the history of this church. We don't mark it with a stone. We mark it with the cross. We mark it with this meeting and come apart to honor the name of Christ. I, I spoke to someone this week and I said, hey, you're going to... You going to come Sunday for the anniversary? And they said, no, we've got something else planned. We'll be serving the Lord. Just not at church. Well, then you can't celebrate the marker with us. You're going to have to do some other thing. You're going to miss the marker. We mark it with this meeting and we say, this church has helped us. Now, I can say it's helped me. Every time I come here, I'm encouraged. So I know it helps you. As you go through that daily, weekly grind, don't you? And that thing rolls over you like it rolls over the tarmac and grinds you down. And you go, whew, can I go in? And then you come to church and you say, yeah, I can do it. I can do it another week. This was good. This helped me. (laughs) Hitherto, the Lord has helped me. The church helps the preacher. I I go to church with my people in Chiwampala. And I I do, you know, know, all these guys on the street and all these, you know, the cheap, the, the cheap children, the street children. Those are the children who live on the street. It's sad, eh? They... They get a little money and they buy some glue and they sniff glue and get high or they sniff petrol. They, they do all kinds of terrible things. And so I, I'll just sit down sometimes and gather them around me and I'll just speak to them in Bimba. And at the end they'll say, hey, give us some money. And I'll say, I can't give you guys money. You know, because you, you do bad things with money. I'll buy you a piece of bread. Okay? And it's sad and it's horrible. And you, and you go through all those things that you go through and you know you go visit the guy at his house and he says, ah, missionary, can you help me? And he unrolls his foot and his foot's gangrene. He needed it cut off about here about... Six months ago. And he's just going to die. And you go through all that and then you, then you show up at church on Sunday and you think, oh, I love these people. These people help me. These are the best people in Zambia. My people. Okay? Not the other people. My people. The church helps me. 
It's a blessing. Christ died for the church. Some of you came to know the Lord how? Through this church. The church didn't save you. But you came to the cross how? Through somebody in this church saying, this is simple. The cross. It, this church brought you to the Lord and said, look. Look and live. It's beautiful. It's simple. Now I said the Lord helps as an intercessor. I'll just read you the verses. You don't have to turn. Just try to... Faith cometh by hearing. Amen. Try to listen. Isaiah 59, 16, it says, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. There was no intercessor in the Old Testament. But now it says in Hebrews 7.25, Hebrews 7, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The Lord helps how? As an intercessor. The Lord helps as a comforter. Ecclesiastes 4.1 Excuse me. I'm running out of fuel. Ecclesiastes 4.1 So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power. But they had no Comforter in the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, John 14, 6, Jesus said, 14, 16, I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. The Lord helps as an intercessor. The Lord helps as a Comforter. Then just simply, the Lord's a helper. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, even in the fire, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. He never leaves. You say, when? I've done some of the most foolish things. There's, there's, a, there's an older lady, she's about 75, Letitia and I go over to her house and we visit with one another and try to encourage one another. And sometimes I'll say something and you'll say, she'll say, you silly sausage. <laughs> and I'll think, well, you know, what are you going to do with that? I mean, you know, that's me. I'm an idiot. Amen. You say, not me. You're, I'm proper. Okay, that's fine. Whether you like that or whether you like me, he never leaves. He never goes, man, you, you, you're silly. You're rotten. I'm out of here. Whoosh. You know what he said? He said, I'll never leave. That helps me. He said, I'll never forsake you. you say, when? When you fail. <laughs> when, you, when you do the wrong thing. When you do the right thing. When you look at your life and you go, what have I done with my life? He said, I've never done that. I'm very successful. Good for you. Some of us sit, some of us sit down and look back and go, whew, that was a quick 30 years. What have I accomplished here? <laughs> Meanwhile, this young child's learned to play six instruments. You say, I never feel like a failure. I'm glad. Good for you. For the rest of us, he's never leaving. Good news is he'll never leave you either, if you're saved. Thank God. Psalm 72, 11 and 12. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him one day, not now. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He said, I don't feel like I have a helper. If you're saved, you do. He said, nobody's helping me. I'm suffering. I'm in the... the Lord's a helper. He said, I just don't feel like he's a helper. He is. Even when you don't feel like it, he is. You know, one day, I'm going to get old. Maybe it's too late to say one day I'm going to get old. <laughs> one day I'm going to get old. If I survive the accidents, I'm going to be sick in bed, and the Lord's going to step into the room, and He's going to say, Son, are you worried? Does it hurt? And He's going to say, Here, take my hand. And He said, You don't have to go alone. I'm going to go on this journey with you. I'll never leave you. You don't have to go out into the valley of the shadow of death by yourself. Fear not. Come on. Let's go. And it'll be glory. And I'm going to say, wow, hitherto, the Lord has helped us. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the precious Word of God and the precious promises. You'll never leave. You'll never forsake. 
Thank you, Lord, that in the battle and in the, just the drudgery and the, the day by day of life, we can plant a marker, the cross of Christ, and say, the Lord has helped us. Father, if there's someone here who doesn't know salvation through Jesus Christ, doesn't know comfort, doesn't know peace, doesn't know that voice of, of comfort that steps in and says, I will never leave thee, son. I'll never forsake thee. Lord, we pray you might deal with them today. Speak to every heart, Lord. Thank you for your help. Help us again, Lord. We need it every day. Bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to give you more of a chance in just a moment to pray about this. I just want to remind you of something of the text where he was reading. 1 Samuel 7, a great Ebenezer moment. And in the life of our church, seven years, that's an Ebenezer moment, right? And then we try to organize a special service to mark the occasion. Do you know what happened in 1 Samuel 8? 1 Samuel 8, the people said, we've had enough of Samuel. And your sons aren't going to get the job done. Give us a king like all the nations. You don't want to get satisfied because you made it to an Ebenezer moment. Hitherto, up until now, the Lord's got us here. Now more than ever, we turn to the Lord for help, guidance, comfort. Let's never start to think, well, it's been seven years. We got it figured out. Look. It's gone pretty good so far. Oh man, only because God's been so good. So for the next seven and the next and the next, we lean more and more on God's gracious hand. Let me have you all stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Just, we'll take a few moments to pray about this. Caleb, if you can play something softly for us. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Last week we put out some benches here. We made an altar. If you've read through your Old Testament, every time you find Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when God did something great in their life, they built an altar to remember the occasion. I want to invite you to make an altar this morning. Say, God, I appreciate you establishing a church where I can learn, where I can get encouraged where I can meet with you. Why don't you come to the altar and say, God, show me what I need to do to be a better member of this church. Show me, God, how I can get involved. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be seen by everyone. What can you do to be a blessing? Wouldn't you like to come and just say, Lord, I recognize that if if it wasn't for you, the Philistines would have got me a long time ago. But you stepped in and did something in my life. And I'll never forget it. Lord, you changed me. Now some have come. If the Lord has spoken to your heart and you need to be saved... And you know He's dealing with you about that. You've heard about the gospel. You know that Jesus is able to change you, save you, give you eternal life. If you've never asked Him to be your Savior, but you'd like to change that today, you you want to get saved, would you just put your hand up? You can put it right back down. I'd just like to pray for you if that's all right. Thank you. I appreciate the honesty. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the honesty. Thank you. I see that hand. Several hands. This is how it works. You've broken God's law and therefore must be punished. But because God loves you so much, He didn't want to punish you. He sent His Son and gave your punishment to His Son. You didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve that. That's why we call it grace. If you want to be saved, you accept what Jesus did for you. You say, Lord, I'm not able to save myself. I'm not good enough. I believe you died to pay for my sins. Please be my Savior. Would you pray that now? 
right where you're at. Genuinely from your heart, say, Lord, I don't want to go one more moment without you living in my heart. You see, folks, we started a church not to entertain you, but by the grace of God to introduce you to a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. If you raised your hand a few moments ago, I sure hope you take seriously the opportunity you have to ask Christ to save you right now. If you have any questions about it, find me after the service. I will stay as long as it takes to help you meet the Lord personally. There's a few still praying. We'll give them another minute or two. Folks, it's been seven years. How involved have you become in the last seven years serving God through a local church? Brother Dobbins gave us an outstanding lesson this morning. Some people are listeners. Some are learners. Some are laborers. Some are leavers. That's who you have in the church. Now, which one are you? I wonder how many of you just listen but it goes in one ear and out the other how many of you learn but never do anything with it oh and it breaks my heart to think of how many people have left because it got hard it's hard to sit in a Bible Bible believing Bible preaching church because it's not popular What a blessing it is, though, to see a few people leave to go to another country and preach the gospel. That makes it worth it. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. We trust that you have spoken to each individual's needs. And Lord, several hands went up, people that would like to be saved today. Now, Father, you know maybe there's questions they have. You know what they need to understand better so that a genuine relationship can start today. Please, Lord, take away all the hindrances, all the obstacles, so that today they can be saved. Father, thank you for seven years of help. Not just the help today, but seven years of help. God, the work is just starting. We don't expect it to get easier, but we're glad to know that you'll be with us every step of the way. Father, would you please... Please send us home with your blessing, with your presence, and bring us back to have some fellowship later today. Lord, the, the, we come back later to, to, to play the games together, to eat together, to get to know each other. God, please be, have your hand on all that we're going to do today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.